I know some, some nights and some days it's easier to go to church than others. The winter, Wednesday nights in the winter, it's tough. You know, you're warm at home, don't want to get back out in the cold, it's dark. Summer's a little bit easier, um, although there's a lot of times things going on in the summer. But, you know, I don't know if it's just because I get to, to, to teach and, and kind of let you sharing what God's given me throughout the week, but I was just really excited and uh, looking forward to uh, going through the Word tonight as I come, and it wasn't, it wasn't hard to come tonight. Tonight was easy. I'm just really excited about what we're going to study tonight. John chapter 6, and uh, see if we can get our technology to go. All right, perfect. All right, so John chapter 6. We are just going to do the first 15 verses uh, tonight. This is a passage that I would say most people who've been in and around church for any period of time uh, have probably heard of. At least you've heard of it. And if you have heard of it, you might even know a lot about the passage we're going to read tonight. It's the feeding of the 5,000. It's uh, the one miracle that Jesus performed that's recorded in all four Gospels. And uh, so it's a very prominent um, a miracle that all four uh, that God placed on the hearts of all four of the gospel writers to to write, and so uh, there's a lot in the Word of God about it. And uh, John uh, tends to give um, some details here that the other ones don't give, and so I think it's it's uh, going to be especially neat for us tonight as we go through this. So what we'll do is instead of reading the whole passage, we'll just walk through it step by step as we get to it, since it's kind of familiar. All right. So John chapter 6 and verse 1, it says here, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, when it talks about after these things, well, in our previous chapter, if you'll remember, the context there was the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, this is going to, in verse 4, refer to the Feast of the Passover being close. So in chronology, this is about six months after what happened in chapter 5. So it's not like it's, you know, the very next day or even a week or a month later. We're about six months after what just happened in chapter 5. So we're going down the road a little bit time-wise. So after these things, after what we read in chapter 5 and, and six months, really, um, of, of ministry that Jesus was doing, is where we're at now. Jesus goes over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, uh, here we have a map of Israel. Uh, right here is Jerusalem with a red dot. Does that, everybody see that? So you got the red dot there. That's Jerusalem where chapter 5 took place. And so what happens here is, is go all the way up. This is the Sea of Galilee. Okay, and there's um, about 70 miles uh, between the two. And so Jesus goes up to the Sea of Galilee, and uh, that's a kind of a, a Google Maps picture there of the Sea of Galilee. We'll get to that in just a moment. So Jesus goes up. It's the spring of the year, if it's the Passover time. It also alludes to that in verse 10, that there is much grass where the people were, so it makes sense that it would be springtime. And so Jesus went from Jerusalem northeast toward the Sea of Galilee. Like I said, that's about a 70-mile trip over six months. That's easily manageable. Um, he went to one of the ports on the western side, of, northwestern side of the, whoops, of the lake there. Uh, this is Gennesaret here. And then uh, he went over the Sea of Galilee, the Sea, uh, sea of Tiberias, to uh, Bethsaida Julius. And there were some mountains, foothills, close by to this area. And that's where the traditional site of the feeding of the 5,000 is because of the setting uh, that we get here in this chapter. So northeast side of the Sea of Galilee is where Jesus is right now. Verse 2. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. So after Jesus leaves Jerusalem and he makes this 70 mile, six month journey, people are following him. Everywhere he goes and heals and does miracles, People are fascinated, and they want to follow him around and see what he's going to do next. And the same here. Now he's up in Galilee. Many people have heard what he's done in Jerusalem, and they want to see what's going on with Jesus. Uh, some wanted to be healed, 
Some wanted to see the show. Um, it's interesting to note that Jesus knew this about them. He knew that their motives were not necessarily to have their spiritual needs taken care of, but that their motives were kind of a, 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 a stimulation, um, a seeing something really cool. Um, as we see in just a minute, and we're going to find out later in this chapter, they were also happy, happy to have him feed them too. So these people were coming from very selfish, non-spiritual reasons. But what I find interesting is, is that Jesus knew that, and yet he healed and fed them. He knew that they were coming for non-spiritual reasons, and he fed them. In other words, Jesus knew they were going to take advantage of him for a handout, and he did it anyway. That was Jesus' mindset. He came to serve. So this is what the, the multitude has come. A great multitude has followed him because they've seen what he's done and they want to see more of it. Verse 3, And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Northeast side of the, of the lake there, of the Sea of Galilee, Bethsaida, he goes up into the mountains alone with his disciples. Um, don't know, we don't get a motive for him going up there. Could be that he was tired, could be that uh, he wanted to pray with them or teach them, but he goes to be alone with his disciples. Now, have you ever been in one of those places or one of those times in your life where you were done being around people and so you just wanted to be alone for a while? Uh, you were done being around the crowds and you wanted it to be quiet and you wanted to hang out with just maybe your family or a few friends and just kind of have a low-key time, you know? And uh, maybe that's where Jesus was headed with this, but then last, look at verse 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Now, before we get into um, the multitudes that come here in verse 5, verse 4 talks about the Passover. Passover is close. Notice how it, verse 4 just kind of seems like it's wedged in to the, the account here. We would think that Jesus goes to the, the disciples, to the mountain with the disciples alone, and they would tell us why, but it wedges in there that it's the feast of the Passover was nigh. Why is that in there? This may seem like minutia on the surface, like it's just thrown in there by happenstance. But it's important to note for purposes of chronology and for what the people are getting to, ready to refer to in verse 14. And we'll get there eventually, but in verse 14, they're looking for, quote, that prophet. And so in their minds, the Passover brings to their mind what God did in Egypt when he delivered them out of bondage in Egypt through who? Who was the human leader? Moses was the human leader uh, to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, into freedom. Okay? And so they were looking for another one like that. They were looking for that prophet, is how they refer to him in verse 14. Uh, not to bring them from Egypt um, to the wilderness to freedom, like Moses did, but they were looking for deliverance from Roman rule by that prophet. So they were in their mind, fresh in their mind, it's close to Passover, it's on their mind of what God did in Egypt, and, and they're getting excited, and they're thinking that maybe this guy could be him who will deliver us from Rome, from Roman rule. So this is why it's important to note, and that's why the Lord chose to put, I believe, verse 4 in there is, is to show us that this is on their mind. It's fresh. Deliverance by a, a wonderful prophet is fresh on their minds in this moment. So verse 5, keeping that in mind, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he was trying to get alone with his friends, and he looks up, and here comes a great company. He looks up at them, and he sees them coming, and he asks Philip a question. He says, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Jesus didn't look at Philip and say, hey, go run them off, I'm tired. <laughs> or, hey, guys, you, can you handle them for a few minutes? I'm going to go a little bit farther and rest. Keep them at bay for an hour, give me a minute, and then I'll be back. He's immediately thinking about serving. Again, remember, keep in mind, he knows their motive. 
He knows they're not coming for spiritual reasons, but he loves people. And he sees them coming, and he looks at Philip, he says, where are we going to get bread for these people to eat? Now, it's a test for Jesus' disciples, and particularly for Philip. He asks him. Isn't it interesting that the Bible points out that he asked Philip? He didn't say one of the disciples. He didn't say the disciples. He asked Philip. So it's a test for Philip. Where are we going to get bread for these people? Where can we buy bread so that they can eat? How are we going to come up with the money to fix this problem? You ever had that come out of your mouth? <laughs> Where are we going to come up with the money for this, right? And it's, it's personal finances, it's church finances, you know? Where is the money going to come from to handle fill in the blank? And so Jesus looks at Philip and asks him this question. And I think what, what we need to be mindful of, and we need to give the disciples a break because they were living this for the first time, we're reading it for the hundredth time, we need to give them a break, but what I think the idea is here, are we more interested in God's glory or our pet projects and getting our way when it comes to the Lord's finances? What are we more interested in? God's glory or figuring things out and getting our way? So Jesus asks this question to Philip, and verse 6 tells us, and, he, and this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. I say this all the time, but it's a good reminder for all of us. Every time I read this verse, I think about this. Jesus never asks a question because he doesn't know the answer. Right? He's omniscient. He knows everything. So he's asking this question so that Philip can find out what's in his heart. And when the Lord asks you and me a question... It's not because he, he needs our, our knowledge or our input. It's because he wants us to see what's in our heart. He wanted to see if Philip was walking by faith or by sight. And you know what? Many times when God questions us, he's wanting to see if we're still relying on me or am I relying on him. And this is where he's at with, with Philip. Are you walking by faith or by sight? Well, we get the answer. Philip's like me and you a lot of times. Philip is thinking about how to afford the bread. Look at his answer, verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that, even, that every one of them may take a little. So that's a pretty good answer. Jesus, I've done the, done the calculations, and, and even 200 days worth of wages, that's 200 penny worth is about 200 days worth of wages. Even 200 days worth of wages wouldn't even really help these folks have a snack, let alone feed them. So he does the calculations. He does the math. He's trying to come up with how to fix this in a physical, monetary way. Now, this isn't to say that caring for God's people and property, uh, that we're not to be prudent and wise. We certainly are. But it does remind us that while we have limited resources, God has unlimited resources. And our first answer should not be, oh no, we can't do this. We can't. He can. And so uh, the lesson for Philip and the disciples and the lesson for us, consequently, is that yes, there are going to be times when it's not going to be in the checkbook, it's not going to be in the savings account, I don't know how we're going to come up with it, but God can. Now remember... Don't take things out of context because a lot of times we'll have a tendency to say, oh, Lord, you provided for the 5,000, provide for me. Well, time out. Jesus was using this as an example for ages to come. There were lots of reasons that Jesus did this for his glory, for the glory of God, and so on and so forth. You and I can't be uh, poor at financial uh, being uh, stewards and then say, okay, Lord, um, I, and I bought a brand new boat, uh, but we don't have groceries. Send the grocery. You know, I mean, you see, we, we, can't, we can't have it both ways. You know what I mean? Uh, God's glory, God's will, he will provide for his glory. Does that make sense? God will provide for his glory. And, and, and as gracious and as good as he is, you and I can get ourselves into, into, into problems sometimes, you know. So we got we to gotta keep in mind that, you know, we can't just live however we want and God will bail us out. Okay, now, 
But Philip is thinking. He's done the calculations. Lord, even if we had 200 days worth of wages, not, not everybody could even have a little. Meanwhile, verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. Now let's just pause right there. You know what's coming, but let's pause right there. Meanwhile, Andrew is out trying to figure out how to feed everyone as well. He's letting Philip do the math, and he's going to go out and try to find practical ways. Basically, Andrew's going, to, going out to see if people have enough to share so that everybody can have a little bit. And he brings this lad to Jesus. What I want to point out here, and I don't know that this is a spiritual application, but I think it's a pretty neat social application, is this. Jesus gives the question, Philip's doing math, Andrew's walking. Isn't that interesting? Who's wrong? Well, let's give him a break, right? What I'm, what I'm trying to point out is this. You got the guy who's business-minded, financially-minded, and then you've got the other guy who's hands-on, practical-minded. You know what that reminds me of? What we call white collar and blue collar. And I, and I think that it's a neat thing that in God's work, both are valuable. You know? Both are valuable in God's work. It's good to have wise, business-minded, uh, intelligent uh, you know, people in God's business and in, in the in the church who can help steer, you know, the steward the Lord's uh, money and properties and things like that. And it's also wonderful to have uh, those people who are hands on and who can fix this and and make this happen. I want to say this. Uh, this week it's been pretty cool. Well, it's been pretty hot, but uh, we had the doors were broke over here. One of the doors were broke over here in the gym and. And I, I know they don't want me to brag on them, but Brother John and Brother Larry, for two days, were out there fixing those doors. They went and bought the parts, and they, and they, and they spent two days in the heat. And they look fantastic. They're more stable than they were. They're straighter than they were. Uh, they're secure now. I mean, thank God for that. And, and both types of people are valuable to ministry. And I think that's neat. I just, Philip was doing the calculations. Andrew was out working. You know, I think that was neat to see that. So, Suffice it to say, no matter who you are, white or blue collar, you're valuable to ministry, to the Lord's service. Isn't that neat? And so, Andrew's trying to figure out how to feed everybody, and he comes across a lad. Verse 9, we read, there's a little boy, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves. Why barley loaves? I think that's cool the Bible puts that detail in there. It turns out barley's cheaper than wheat. And so, these weren't even the best bread. You know, it was, it was um, maybe the... Uh, you know, you got Wonder Bread, and then you got Kroger Brand, you know, and uh, I don't know, we eat Kroger Brand, I don't care, but, but barley, barley loaves were cheaper than, than the wheat loaves, so you even got this little lunch that's not like five star, you know, it's, it's not Montgomery Inn, it's McDonald's, okay, you see what I'm saying, and so he finds this little lad who's got um, this lunch, and Andrew comes up, Maybe a little excited at first and says, okay, there's this lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. And I wonder if Andrew didn't go looking around a little bit and say, but what is this and what are they among so many? Maybe Andrew was a little embarrassed. Once he saw the disciples looking at him like, really? A kid's lunch? You know, I don't know. I I'm just trying to be human here for a minute. Maybe he's, he's excited, and then, then he realizes, yeah, but man, a lot of people here in that little lunch. I mean, but he was trying. What are they among so many, is what Andrew said. Maybe you'd feel to underline that verse, and here's why, that part of that verse. We need to be careful that we don't get down and discouraged when what we have seems insignificant. In our economy, it may not be much, but thank God he see, sees things way differently than we do. I hear Christians all of the time saying, well, pastor, I can't do much, but I can do this little thing or that little thing. Or, Pastor, I, I can't do what I used to do, so this is all I can do now. Let me encourage you tonight. 
The idea is not what we do, but what is our aim in what we do? What's our goal? Why are we doing it? What we do is not as important as why we're doing it in the Lord's work. So you may think, well, I can't do what I used to do. And maybe you can't physically do what you used to do. But whatever you can do, if you're doing it with God's glory and your, as your aim, as your goal, that's what God's looking for. That's what matters. That's what's going to carry some weight in heaven. And when our works are burned up, that will be the precious stones and the gold and the silver because that's going to last. Because although it may have seemed little and insignificant, it made a huge impact on the glory of God. So don't, don't be discouraged if you feel like you can't do what you used to do or uh, you can't do what you want to do. 1 Corinthians 10.31 you know this one. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now listen, if I can eat and drink to the glory of God, then anything I do here to serve the Lord, as little as it may seem, I can do for the glory of God. Think about this. When we have Fifth Sunday in a couple weeks and we go down there, did you know that we can eat and drink to the glory of God? We can. Now, if I can sit on my sorry carcass down there and I can eat a sandwich and have some Kool-Aid and some chips and some salad, and I can do that to the glory of God, then for sure, any of my service to God, whether we think it's a big deal or a little deal, it can be done to the glory of God. That is amazing. That is fantastic. That's astounding. That's encouraging. Because listen, there's coming a day when all of us are probably going to say, I can't do what I used to do. That's life. But I'm glad that God doesn't say, you know, when you run out of steam physically, you're done. <laughs> What's your heart? And if what you do is for the glory of God, that's going to last. And here's the question we have to ask. Is it about my reputation or God's glory? Because if it's about my reputation, I'm going to think my service is insignificant. I'm going to think that what I'm doing compared to what brother so-and-so is doing doesn't matter if it's my reputation that's on the line. If I'm worried about what people are going to think about me versus doing it for the glory of God, it's a waste. So am I more concerned about my reputation or God's glory? Man, what a, what a freeing thought tonight. It can't be reiterated enough that God's not looking for great strength or numbers or large quantities. God is looking for a willing heart to use what it has for his glory. And then he can take little and make much. Uh, 1 Samuel 14. Keep your finger there in John 6 and turn to 1 Samuel 14. And um, the setting here is Jonathan and one of his servants, 1 Samuel 14. Jonathan and one of his servants are going, and they're really outnumbered. They're looking at the Philistines. They're outnumbered, and they're worried about, well, his servant's kind of worried about if they're going to be able to handle all these Philistines. And here's what Jonathan says, and it's an awesome thought here. Uh, 1 Samuel 14, verse 6. Jonathan says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. He says, look, man, let's just go. Let's trust the Lord because God is not limited by our strength. God could save Israel by millions or he could save Israel by me and you. Let's go. Isn't that a great thought? Man, what an inspiring quote there. God's not limited to us and our strength. We give him what we have, and it can be unlimited. It's pretty cool. Verse 10 in John chapter 6. So he brings up the lad, but what are these among so many? Uh, verse 10, and Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, 
So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Reclining here at this moment would have been pretty comfortable. There was a lot of grass there. It wasn't like it was rocky or sandy. There was a lot of grass, so it was springtime, Passover time. It was good for them to sit there. Now, it says there that there was about 5,000, in number about 5,000 men. In antiquity, when numbering a crowd or an army, etc., um, they would only count men above 20 years of age. That's how they did things. They would only count men 20 years in age. And there may have been children and women there, but for their count, they only counted the men. And so it is conceivable that uh, there are possibly somewhere between 5,000 low end to 25,000 or maybe even more people that are there that day. Somewhere in between that count. Now, we don't know, but it's somewhere in between that. By the way, the word men... It says, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. That word men there, that's not like the word man for mankind or humans. That word men refers to the male gender. So we know for sure that they're not just talking about mankind or the men in that place, meaning people. It specifically refers to 5,000 men. And in tradition and antiquity, we realize there was more than 5,000 people there in that moment. So 5,000 men plus women and children sit down And what's going to happen? Verse 11, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Now this is the cool part. This is the part we all like. Jesus takes the loaves, and and he asks a blessing. He gives thanks. A traditional patriarchal prayer um, from the Jewish people at that time was something like this. Blessed are you, Lord our God, who brings forth uh, bread from the earth. So that was a typical prayer that they would say before they ate. And so we don't know if Jesus said that, but he possibly could have. Nonetheless, he gives thanks. The Bible says he distributes them to the disciples. Now this is my favorite part. So we know there were at least 12 baskets there, right? Verse 13 tells us there were 12 baskets of leftovers. So at the very least, there are 12 baskets. I love this. So you got this, each disciple, 12 disciples, holding a basket. There are five loaves, two fish. So in my mind, I don't know if this is true or not, I don't know if this happened, but go with me on this, okay? Jesus takes one of those barley loaves, a little barley loaf, breaks it in half, one in one basket, one in the other. Now if he breaks five loaves in half, how many pieces of bread does he have? Ten. Awesome. Who said twelve? Andrew, was that you? I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, no, there's ten. So you fill ten baskets with one half a loaf. How many fishes were there? How many baskets are left? One fish in one basket, one fish in the other. I loved it. I don't know if this is how this happened, but this is so cool to me. Could you imagine Jesus walks up, psh, psh, you know, and the disciples are going, I've got a half a piece of bread. And note that the Bible said they were small fishes. We're not talking about salmon, right? We're not talking about tuna. We're talking about small fishes, the kind I catch at the men's retreat, okay? The tiny ones. Small fishes. So imagine those disciples, 12 men standing there with baskets with one little bit of food in each. And look what it says in verse 11. He distributed to the disciples, and the disciples then were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Can you imagine being a disciple in that moment? Jesus gets done putting the food in the basket, and he says, okay, go feed them. I don't know when the miracle took place. I don't know if when Jesus broke the bread and put it in the baskets, if they filled up, and the disciples were like, yeah! Or if it happened while they were walking to the people, and all of a sudden the baskets were full, Or, if that didn't happen until they put the basket down in front of the first person. My opinion, doesn't matter a hill of beans, is that that's the way it happened. Here's why. Several times in the Bible we see that um, God will come through once the people step out in faith. Uh, One of the times I'm thinking of, when the priests were carrying the ark across the River Jordan, when did the river part? Does anybody remember that? When the sole of their foot hit the water. The waters didn't part as they walked up to the bank. God waited for them to put their foot in to see if they really believed him before the waters parted, you see. 
And so I don't know if that's how it happened, but could be. But could you imagine being a disciple? And Jesus says, all right, go. And they're looking at each other. Is he serious? These people are going to mock us. We're going to run out of food. They're going to beat us. They're going to call us frauds. They're going to think he's a fraud. What is he doing? Jesus didn't give an explanation. He said, go, distribute. You know what that reminds us of? When God says go, go. I'm going to look like a fool, God. Hey, if God's sending you, he ain't going to make you look like a fool. And if he does, remember, what's it about? My reputation or his glory? We've got to get over that. We've got to get over it being about my reputation and being about his glory. So the disciples go, and uh, they go feed the people. And could you imagine as they walk up, and, and, and they just kind of look at the guy sitting there, and they go, and all of a sudden, people just start reaching in and pulling out all kinds of bread and fish. I mean, that must have been something to be there that day. I wish I could have been there when the thousands were fed with just two fish and some bread. What's the other words? <laughs> it's a song. I'm quoting a song. Yeah, it's a Southern Gospel song. I couldn't remember it. But anyway, uh, I was going to sound cool, and you were going to think I came up with that on my own, but I didn't. All right. But I wish I could have been there on that day. So Jesus tells them they go distribute, verse 12, and when they were filled, the people were full. Maybe 25,000 people were full from five pieces of bread and two fish. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. When they were filled, he said unto the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Now when they were filled, I don't know about you, but when I eat, sometimes that includes seconds and thirds, right? So they could go back and get more if they wanted until they were filled. It wasn't like, you know, it's a buffet, not a, not a one plate thing. You know what I mean? You could eat as much as you want until you were filled. Jesus made sure they were filled. He didn't give them just enough to scrape by with. He gave them leftovers to take home. Now, that's Rupp Arena. Rupp Arena seats nearly 25,000 people. You can't see the other side there because of all those banners at the top. I don't know if you can see that there. There's a lot of banners at the top there. It almost just blacks out everything because, you know, all the championships we've won, which we still won more than North Carolina. So there's all these banners, up, but there, Rupp Arena seats 25,000 people when it's sold out, which is pretty regularly. <laughs> Could you imagine... 25,000 people coming into Rupp Arena for a basketball game and going to the concessions and them saying, we've got five pieces of bread and two fish. Who's hungry? It's been a madhouse. I can't believe they didn't prepare for it. You know, look at that. The sea of people. That's about 25,000 people. Five loaves, two fish fed all them until they were full. You see, in our mind, a lot of times we have we think of a scattering of a few people here and there, and Jesus did. That's incredible. It's incredible. And that is God's country, so maybe it happened there. I don't know. <laughs> Moving on, before I get struck by lightning. So they gathered 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above that uh, unto them that had eaten. Now, verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Those men had read about this before. They had heard about this before. Moses fed the Israelites in the wilderness with bread out of nowhere. It was called manna. It's a picture there, a rendering of Moses and the people gathering manna. Moses on, in the wilderness prayed and God sent manna out of nowhere and everyone ate. They've seen this before. So now they're watching Jesus and they're starting to draw the parallels. This guy just did the same thing that Moses did. He must be like Moses. He must be that prophet that will deliver us. 
And here's a painting of Jesus, of, of Jesus standing there at the Sea of Galilee on the mountain and all the people down there and they're taking and distributing the bread. They've seen this, they've read of this before. A miracle from God, a deliverer had come and now they started to get excited. But don't miss out on the spiritual application of what we can consider to be our physical challenges. They came hungry. The children of Israel were hungry, but it wasn't about the physical. It was about the spiritual. Jesus, watch verse 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Jesus heard him. He heard them going through that, wait a minute, Moses did this. This guy must be that prophet. They were getting excited. They were getting ready to go make him their deliverer. They were ready to take him down into Jerusalem and proclaim him as the deliverer. Perhaps he would go into the Roman authorities and it would be just like Moses and Pharaoh and God would deliver us. He's here. He is that prophet. And Jesus snuck out of there. He got out of there. It was not, he was not there to lead them from the Romans. Why did he come? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He wasn't a deliverer in the same sense as Moses. And that would disappoint the people, as we'll see in the future, as we know happened. <clears throat> he came to save their souls. But they were only focused on one thing. The here and now, my needs being met, my safety, my protection, my comfort. And oh my, isn't that where we live most of the time? Let us be reminded that God's way more interested in our spiritual health than our physical health and comfort. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this time tonight in your word. We uh, ask, Lord, that you would help us to keep our mind, set our affection on things above. Lord, that we would walk by faith and not by sight. Help us to see through the physical to the spiritual and be more concerned with our spiritual needs and the spiritual needs of others. We ask these things in Jesus' name.